we could start, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, dear friends. Uh, welcome to uh, this, uh, uh, what we call TPP, but it's a nickname, but it's not the traditional TPP, you know. It's more what we call trade policy preview uh, of our group of the Friends of Multilateralism. We launched this exercise uh, last year and we did China, we did others. And the purpose of this is that uh, by doing this in advance of uh, the traditional trade policy review of the member concerned, we try to provide a kind of uh, an informal platform and to help uh, our community ambassadors, international organizations, think tank, academia, everybody. Uh, and to, to jump out of the, the box uh, and then to, to really uh, do a kind of candid, forward-looking uh, discussion on the trade policy trends of the key players. So today we are very honored and very glad to do this for Pakistan, and this will be followed by some other members uh, all the way to the end of the year. The second point is that uh, the FMG board has decided to ask our dear friend, our member, uh, Clem, to lead on this uh, whole process, uh, this uh, TPP exercise. There's no other person to do this, given his background, his experience and everything. Uh, so on behalf of the group, I thank him for his leadership and also his great efforts uh, putting into this. I also thank our panelists today and also the audience. So with that, I look forward to, uh, to a fruitful discussion uh, with you all. And over to you, Clem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lou, thank you very much. And I see that the room is gradually filling up. Uh, just before we start with our speakers, one or two words to complement what, what Lou has said. I'm sorry, my screen is behaving strangely. OK, done. Uh, we all value, I think, and I value in particular, the trade policy review mechanism of the WTO. I, I think it's an essential element for transparency. It helps members understand each other better. And it, by and large, I think, encourages members to abide better by their multilateral obligations. This is an exercise that we are now embarking on to bring a somewhat larger community into this particular transparency exercise. We will have the FMG uh, members, but we will also have members, be, we will also have participants beyond the members themselves. The members themselves are the ones who discuss the trade policy review. As Lou said, we thought it appropriate to give a slightly broader purview uh, to the whole exercise. That does not mean that we are in competition with the WTO trade policy review mechanism. We are not at all. Rather, we have admiration for the mechanism and we seek to complement it to help the transparency exercise. That said, I should point out that we do not have access to the WTO papers and nor do we seek access to the WTO papers. We are going to rely for our review, reviews, previews of the trade policies of a member on experts in the country itself, on people who know a great deal about the country and who will then guide us through the policies that are presently of concern uh, for the country. And also, as Simon is going to show us, policies that actually might maintained by others that might be affecting the country. I think that's an important element in this process as well. Uh, we have, we've done this twice before, once with China, once with Russia. We are now uh, embarking on the, on Pakistan, embarking, that's a big word, but we're now going to do Pakistan. Pakistan trade policy review will be on the 30th. We hope that this leads to a preview, a, a sense of what is important for the trade policy review. We have introduced some changes relative to what we did in the past. And in particular, I think an important change and improvement is that we've asked our fellow FMG member, Simon, Simon Evanet, to dig into his database, to dig into the trade alert, and to let us know 
exactly what it uh, to let us give us a sense of the measures that Pakistan uses and the measures that impinge on Pakistan's own ability to access the multilateral trading system. Uh, Simon, as you know, uh, is the founder of the trade uh, of the of the trade alerts. He's done a, a fantastic job. I remember when we first started out, I, I actually hoped that we might be able to join forces in all of this. I was at the WTO at the time. Unfortunately, that didn't work, but there is now a trade database, which is of significant importance to all members of the multilateral trading community. And I thank Simon very much for having done, for taking this, taking the effort, taking the initiative, taking the time to build this base. And I think that we're all going to see just how useful that base is when he presents us with his information on Pakistan. And he can do this for virtually every country that there is. It's a significant achievement. We will then be fought, we will then have a former ambassador to the WTO, Mansoor Ahmed, to speak to us. And I will say a bit more just before I introduce him. But then we have another somewhat new uh, uh, <clears throat> A new approach, new new matter. We have asked the W the recently appointed WTO chair. The WTO has a chairs program, and there's they've just appointed a chair in Pakistan, Professor Azam Chowdhury. He is going to be with us, and he too will give us an, an idea of what it is that is of concern in the trade policy in uh, Pakistan at the moment. I hope thereafter that we are joined by, yes, I see that Mr. Jabbar is with us and he is from the Chamber of Commerce in Pakistan. And also, uh, he's also Consul General for, UK, for the Ukraine in Pakistan, which I find somewhat intriguing. Uh, with all that said, I'm going to now give the floor to Simon. Simon, please take us away on this and please uh, split the screen so that we can follow your, uh, we can follow your your slides. Thank you, Simon. The floor is yours. Thank you, Clem, uh, for inviting me to present on this uh, on this trade policy review. I have a, a short slide deck which summarizes uh, the material that I've assembled. I'm going to do essentially uh, four things. First, to try and put uh, Pakistan's trade policy in the context of its economic development trajectory, so that that um, I think situates the discussion. Since after all, you know, the purpose of one of the purposes of trade policy is to help countries advance their own development processes in a manner they see fit. Then um, I'm going to turn to the information we have on Pakistan's um, trade policy stance. Then the third thing I will do will be discuss the trade impediments to Pakistan's exports in foreign markets. And in my view, these facts will then raise three questions which uh, we may or may not want to take up in the discussion. So that's my goal. Let me start then with uh, setting the scene. Here are some important uh, contextual information about the economic trajectory of Pakistan. This is a moderately sized economy, quarter of a trillion dollars, which is growing relatively slowly. Um, the GDP per capita, which is our traditional measure of, uh, of uh, living standards, is depending on how you measure it, either stagnating or has uh, or is, is inching up slowly over time. Manufacturing GDP in Pakistan over the past decade has stagnated. Exports have fallen back. Perhaps the most extraordinary thing about uh, Pakistan's export performance is that the unit export values are falling on trend quite quickly. So something about the products being exported from Pakistan is not earning a particularly high currency or lots of currency on foreign markets. And on the import side, we also see unit values falling as well. The one bright spot we see in Pakistan's uh, uh, trajectory over the last seven years is a reduction in uh, the poverty rate, uh, which is down six percentage points uh, and is clearly uh, a welcome development. So uh, this, hopefully this overview gives you a sense of uh, the type of economy that we are discussing here and uh, the trade performance uh, that it has witnessed um, over the past decade. Let me turn now to the uh, assessment of trade policy stance. What I'm going to do is to draw from the Global Trade Alert uh, database 
um, drawing from uh, the uh, different reports we have on Pakistan's trade policy interventions since uh, November 2008. Um, of those uh, policy interventions, there's four, there are 477 of them, all but 33 are documented with official sources. So this is very, very high quality information. I should add that the trade policy monitoring database of the WTO has 135 entries on Pakistan. And so our, uh, our database is a little bit more comprehensive. And that's what I've chosen to use as we go forward. As of last Sunday, uh, when I went into our database, uh, we found 306 uh, policy interventions which were still in force. Two thirds of them harm uh, foreign commercial interests, one third benefit uh, foreign commercial interests. If one looks at the breakdown of policies, uh, what is striking is the role that tariff changes play, either in terms of liberalizing Pakistan's markets or in terms of restricting access to those markets. This is not to suggest that other factors are not important, other policies are unimportant, but in terms of the sheer number of policy changes out there, it is dominated heavily by tariff changes. Now, this is just a, a series of counts of policy interventions. What one can do is track uh, which policy, which products are affected by those policy interventions, and then calculate how much trade is covered. And that was the next thing I did. And now I focused only on the policy developments since the last TPR of Pakistan. And what we can see is that over time, uh, there has been a progressive buildup of the share of national imports into Pakistan, which have faced liberalizing conditions and which have faced more restrictive conditions. And so we estimate that around 60 to percent of Pakistan's imports face trade restrictions that were not there at the time of the last TPR, which is a, you know, a significant policy change or change in policy stance. But we should also note in the interest of balance that uh, there's slightly more um, imports, uh, share of imports into Pakistan, which have benefited from liberalization too. So this is a country which actively um, is managing its treatment of uh, imports. And we can see from the dotted lines when we compare them to the solid lines, that most of the action is in the area of tariffs. So tariffs of different types, and there are many different types in Pakistan, is where the action is. Uh, and maybe we can come back to that uh, later. So this is it gives you a sense of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the scale of the policy change over uh, since the last TPR. The other thing that we can do in our database is to find out which foreign trading partners are facing uh, more restrictive trading conditions inside uh, Pakistan. And there are 13 trading partners in the, of Pakistan where, who export goods to Pakistan, where more than half a billion dollars worth of goods are facing more restrictive trading conditions than at the time of the last TPR. And you can see that there are two countries which stand out in terms of um, seeing their trade covered by import restrictions, and this is the UAE and China, but there are many other countries who have seen uh, more than a billion dollars of their exports face tougher uh, market access conditions in uh, Pakistan. Now, there is no suggestion here that these tougher market access conditions represent violations of Pakistan's legal obligations. I leave that to the lawyers to determine, uh, but I, our job is merely to point out uh, that there have been quite a number of changes and uh, Pakistan should not be surprised if some of their trading partners pick, have picked up on these changes and they may well, I guess, intervene in the TPR process. So this um, completes my summary then of the trade policy stance of Pakistan and of the trading partners which are affected by it. I turn now to the third matter which I said I would discuss, which is the market access impediments which are facing Pakistan's goods exporters. Now, of course, Pakistan is a member of the WTO largely, uh, or, or in part rather, to secure access to foreign markets with the goal, hopefully, of uh, improving living standards in Pakistan. And so the question arises, since the last TPR, what has happened to Pakistan's um, market access abroad? And uh, this, is, this chart gives you the answer. Uh, since 2015, we can see a progressive increase in the share of Pakistan's exports, which have faced worse market access conditions abroad. Uh, we estimate that around 70 to 75% of Pakistan's exports face some type of trade 
impediment that they did not face at the time of their last TPR. And if you look at the different lines carefully, you'll see that most of the undercutting of Pakistan's exports comes from subsidies either offered to other firms competing in third markets or by or subsidies offered to local import competing firms. The falling off of the subsidies to local import competing firms that you see in 2021 is purely a reporting matter. Um, the data, especially on Chinese uh, subsidies, uh, becomes available in the first two quarters of the year far prior to the year that they were awarded. And so these numbers will be no doubt revised upwards significantly. But the broad pattern and the broad conclusion is that uh, like many other WTO members, Pakistan's exports are undercut by the subsidies of other trading partners. It is true that we see um, uh, tariff increases and also uh, other trade impediments which are getting in the way of Pakistan's exports, but the you know, biggest action, the biggest exposure is to other countries' subsidies. In terms of uh, the markets where Pakistan's uh, imports are at greatest risk. This is another thing we can calculate in our database. We can look product by product and market by market to find out where since the last TPR, Pakistan's uh, exports have uh, faced worse market conditions and uh, the countries which have taken steps which, uh, uh, which put at risk more than $100 million of Pakistani exports are listed in this chart here. You can see them. Uh, the, uh, the effects are concentrated in a small number of jurisdictions. And these are the jurisdictions where uh, maybe Pakistan may want to pay more attention to market developments there. Uh, but more generally, as I said, uh, it would appear uh, that subsidies are one of the areas where uh, Pakistan might uh, want to pursue an offensive agenda. Let me draw my conclusion to a close by um, raising, uh, by pointing to three questions which are raised by these facts. The first question must surely be, what policy objectives and other factors account for the extensive resort to import changes, import tariff changes by Pakistan? And whatever the objectives are being pursued, is there some better way of pursuing them or cheaper way of pursuing them than using import tariffs? We all know that import tariffs introduce two distortions to consumption and production. Is there a, a more efficient way of attaining whatever goals Pakistan has for its economy? Secondly, uh, I was struck by the evidence that uh, the unit values of Pakistan's exports are falling quite quickly. This suggests that Pakistan's uh, exporters are not able uh, to secure as much benefit as they have done in the past from the goods that they export. And so the question is, what steps can we be taken to help upgrade Pakistan's exporters? And what steps can the rest of the world do to help Pakistan in this regard as well? And the last question, uh, how can the information presented here in particular in the last section, inform the identification and pursuit of Pakistan's offensive trade policy objectives, whether they are in bilateral discussions, regional discussions, or at the multilateral level. Thank you very much for your time. Simon, thank you very much for, for that presentation. It's wonderful. I'm going to, without further ado, actually, I'm going to give the floor immediately to Manzur Ahmed. He, he and I first met when, uh, for a, in preparation for one of the early Pakistan trade policy reviews, when he was a member for customs in Pakistan. Subsequently, he became uh, ambassador to the WTO and did an outstanding job next to Alejandro, who's smiling very benignly. <laughs> Manzur, it is a delight to see you again, and perhaps, and somewhat in the same context as when we first met. I'm delighted to ask you to present your views on trade policy developments in Pakistan, bearing in mind perhaps also some of the things that Simon has said, and in particular that you know 75% of your exports now face more restrictions than they did for five, six years ago. It's up to you, Manzur. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Clem, and thank you to the friends of Multilateralism Group uh, for this opportunity. As you just uh, said, Clem, I was part of one of uh, that uh, 2002, but subsequently also in 2008, uh, I was then in Geneva. But uh, then I was uh, representing the government of Pakistan, but this time, thanks to this forum, 
I have the chance to be candid and give independent views. My, but before I go there, um, let me say a, a few points about uh, the previous uh, TPRs and my takeaway from those, uh, those TPRs. Although a lot of time and resources uh, were spent uh, both from, from Pakistan as well as from WTO Secretariat for those TPRs, but I felt we didn't really gain much from those. And I think the key reason was that once the TPRs were conducted, there was very limited follow-up. As a result, those TPRs could not contribute much to trade policy reforms. I just see, you know, Simon making excellent points, and I wish, uh, you know, uh, our our Ministry of Commerce, everybody from from the lowest desk officer to the minister was here listening to all this and trying to do something about what he has pointed out. But anyway, so uh, coming to the current TPR. I, I have, uh, you know, you, you just give me, I think, 10 minutes or something. So I'm, I'm, I just foc I'll focus only on trade policy issues uh, uh, and, and also uh, respond to what uh, Simon just said. And, and uh, maybe not, I will not discuss other macroeconomic issues. Okay, let me first, uh, some good things about, uh, let me say what were the reforms we have undertaken since, since the last TPR. One was the implementation of the, uh, it, it uh, I should say, uh, it came from there for the implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. Uh, I think we have recently made some good progress, 86% implementation. And I think this is one reason that in the last uh, and, uh, World Bank index of trading across the borders, I think we took a very big jump of some 28 points because of this. Um, and one of the most challenging tasks we had while trying to implement this um, uh, WTO uh, TFA was uh, implementation of the Pakistan single window. It required uh, getting together some 70 or over 70 regulatory authorities on one platform that included banks and insurance companies, customs, port authorities, and everybody. And we have made a lot of progress in, 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 in this connection. It also required a lot of money, but with uh, some uh, financial assistance from, from donors, we, we were able to do this. Now, the second major reform that uh, I think would be of some interest, uh, Simon was referring to so much uh, role of tariffs in Pakistan. And one of the reasons so much uh, custom tariff was so much, uh, had so much role was because this tariff setting was done by the Federal Board of Revenue. And their main uh, concern is about raising revenue. And since we are always short on revenues, so what they do is the easiest way is look at imports, raise some more revenue, either through custom duty or import. And, 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 and as a result, almost 50% of our taxation revenue is coming from imports. I'll, I'll discuss this a little bit later as well. Now, I, I, I think I'll, I'll move on to, you know, the point I was making is that this has, this tariff setting exercise has been moved from F, Federal Board of Revenue to Ministry of Commerce. So hopefully now there'll be more balance and they'll be looking more at, uh, um, you know, the uh, trade policy as well while setting up, uh, while looking at these tariff rates. Now I come to some of the shortcomings. I mean, Simon has just said, uh, you know, he's explained it already that uh, in the last two decades, um, really we have, we have been very, our performance has been not good. And if, if I look at other uh, region, countries in the, in the region, they, they have gained trade share, whereas Pakistan has lost it. I think the World Bank estimates show that every year we are losing about 1.45% uh, our global trade share. Uh, now, now let me come to some of the reasons which I feel are responsible for this, and I'll, I'll only refer to, there are many other reasons, but they, I'll only refer to trade policy. I think the most severe impediment in Pakistan's international trade policies is is domestic tariff and non-tariff barriers. First, I uh, I, and I, here I quote another World Bank study that uh, for, uh, 
I think they did an analysis of 70 countries which export over 20 billion in annual exports. And they found that Pakistan had the highest tariffs of those 70 countries. That is one big problem. Uh, because somehow there's no realization that uh, those days of protectionism, infant industry, import substitutions, et cetera, have gone now, we have to move on. And, and still we, there's, a, there's a thinking that uh, like, I think it's President Trump that imports are very bad and you know, we should only focus on, and without imports, you can't have exports. Okay, and then this other uh, big problem is these non-tariff uh, measures. Um, I think there was a recent study by ITC. They showed that uh, we have twice as many non-tariff measures as, as other developing countries. And if we were to bring them at the same level as other developing countries, perhaps our exports could grow by something like 50%. Um, as a result of these high tariffs, we have not been able to integrate our, our, uh, our economy uh, either in the region or globally. Uh, rest of the world calls it an Asian century and they're moving their trade here. And we are still focused only, not only, but about, you know, majority, 60% of our trade is still focused in your United States and Europe include, and UK. I think Pakistan's uh, uh, location should have been its greatest asset, but it has not leveraged it to its advantage. With the recent improvements under this China-Pakistan economic corridor, we have built some very good modern roads and we have the potential to be the regional uh, hub for uh, transit and trade. Uh, but unfortunately, whereas the uh, global average, I think, is about 40% in uh, regional trade, Pakistan is, is uh, less than 5%. Um, just recently, um, I think last year, all ASEAN and uh, other Asian countries, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, they, they became a member of this uh, Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, RCEP. And this is the world's largest free trade area. Pakistan has made no effort to join that bloc. And uh, in fact, Pakistan is not a part of any significant trading bloc. It, it, it was, um, uh, you know, at one time we thought the South Asia Free Trade Agreement or SEFTA would be, uh, you know, a big uh, step forward. But because of political tensions, um, no trade is taking place for as far as Pakistan is concerned under that. And uh, according to a World Bank study, if we were to normalize trade with India, our trade would grow 15 fold. You know, they, they, they were, I think before we had this tensions and even the, the trade, whatever was happening was uh, shut down, that at least uh, it could grow to 37 billion. Another problem, Pakistan has been uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, uh, related or linked issue is that bilateral FTAs. We have been negotiating with many countries for many, many years, but because of our thing, our, our high tariffs and our protectionist mindset, we have not made much progress. I think with, with Turkey, it's been 15 years and, and, and so was with, uh, uh, I think with, with Thailand and Singapore and South Korea, many others, seven, eight, 10 years have gone, but we have not made much progress. There are a few FTAs like we had with uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Mauritius, but uh, I think in terms of WTO, we would not really call them FTAs because they cover very few items. They don't cover substantial trade. I think the only uh, one big um, FTA, uh, one significant FTA is with China. But again, it's not really working for Pakistan for two reasons. One, uh, from the Pakistani side, they, they didn't really um, you know, open up their sensitive sector like, like the autos and, and, and uh, electrical machinery and uh, electronics, et cetera. And the Chinese side, they, they got more concessions. But since China has, has entered into FTAs with many other countries and it's now a part of RCEP, et cetera, so Pakistan has no real preference in, in, in that market. Um, 
One other uh, thing that I would like to point is that uh, we have not been able to adjust our trading patterns to international um, international changes or whatever I should say. You know, whereas uh, some 70% of uh, global trade now takes place through global value chains, but we have very low participation, GVC participation. Um, and that's one reason, uh, I think Simon asked that question, that is one reason that we have not been able to move up to high tech sectors. Uh, we continue with that textile and clothing and yarn, et cetera. And uh, whereas engineering goods now make up something like 50% of other countries' exports, Pakistan is less than 5%. Uh, one, two other points that I, I mentioned, I think I have uh, two more minutes. One is about uh, Pakistan's still continuation with import substitution policy. And here I especially mentioned uh, our auto policy. We were, I can give you a few examples, just one example, maybe Indonesia and Pakistan were about the same producing 200,000 cars in, in year 2002. And when those um, WTO agreement on trade related investment measures, trims came into being, uh, many other countries, either they were forced through WTO dispute settlement or they did it on their own. They opened up their uh, you know, auto industry and, and, and let the parts come from elsewhere and uh, improve the car industry. Pakistan somehow has been able to dodge it and fortunately or unfortunately, it was not taken to WTO system. So we have still have same. Now, Indonesia, now, after 15 years, uh, uh, now in, in, in 20 years, is producing about a million cars and Pakistan is still stuck at the, that 200,000 because of it, if import is very high protection for auto industry and the auto industry does not look outside Pakistan to export anything, they only look within the country. So uh, I, uh, I think, I, I, yeah, yeah, just, just what, uh, Clem, sorry, uh, one, one, one or two other points. I th since Pakistan, it's becoming very difficult for Pakistan to do any unilateral reforms, it's best if it was to do it through, uh, you know, joining other agreements. Like, for example, the, uh, it, it, it should have acceded to this information technology agreement of WTO. It's been 20 years. It's been getting various studies. It has been pay, the country has been paying to various uh, consultants and every time a study comes and then another study comes and it's been 20 years and they've not been able to make up their mind. Now what's ITA? ITA is about giving more access to your own country people for, for, for IT products, but they've not. And now I see that in WTO, there's this other initiative on e-commerce and some, uh, I don't know, 86 countries with 90% world trade and Pakistan is staying out, out of it. Although if I look at within the country, there's a lot of emphasis. Everybody is talking about e-commerce and excited and there's uh, some, some, they're trying to attract foreign investment and, and they think this is the future. But in case of WTO, they're, they're just uh, staying out of it. So I do hope finally that uh, the, the government will carefully analyze the proceeding of this particular session today, trade policy preview, along with the trade policy review. And, and then um, they will take, uh, undertake some reforms. And, and the best thing is to integrate with, with the other economies in the region and, and, and elsewhere. And I think that's the only way we are of getting our people out of poverty. And, and, and I thank you and I stop here. Thank you. Manzur, thank you very, very much. And before I go on, perhaps you might think a little bit about two questions that I have and come to, back, come to later on. Almost 50% of your re government revenue comes from tariffs, as you said. Are any efforts being made to diversify the revenue base, improve domestic collection? That might well improve the lower the cost of imports in the production of your exports and improve the export performance of Pakistan. And then secondly, you wrote a, you wrote a, a piece recently about improving, liberalizing Pakistan's trade with India. It would be interesting to hear you say a bit more, a bit more about that perhaps later on, particularly as you mentioned the potential for enormous improvements in trade flows between those two. But before we go on to that, I'm going to uh, give the floor to uh, Azam 
Are you there, Azam Chowdhury? Yes, I am here. Thank you, Clem. Shall I start? I'm looking for you. No, no, please. Okay, it's I'm just sorry. that I'm, I, I'm looking here. for you, and I don't see you. I don't know what's happened to the screen. But Chowdhury is professor at the Lahore School of Economics. He recently became a chair in the WTO Chairs Program. That's a program that seeks to improve the knowledge in Pakistan of, uh, in, in the respective countries of the WTO. There is a re research component to this program. There is a curriculum development, particularly with respect to trade, to trade, uh, trade, develop, trade policy with an emphasis on the WTO. And then there is uh, a, an outreach now, in these programs have contributed enormously to a to members understanding of the WTO, and we look forward to this happening as well in Pakistan. I thought it appropriate, Lou joined me in thinking it appropriate, that we invite Professor Chowdhury Azam to talk to us in this particular about Pakistan's trade policies, both because he is an expert in that area but also because that helps introduce him to the Geneva WTO-based community. Azam, I look forward to listening to you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Clem. Thank you, Lou. Uh, let me thank uh, the FMG for putting this together. Uh, first, uh, it's difficult to follow in the footsteps a few minutes after uh, the ambassador, Manzur Ahmad, who's considered the godfather of a lot of the trade-related policies and research which is done. So I, 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 I thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, Simon. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought that was very relevant and actually sets up, uh, sets the scene for some of the issues I was going to do. And I did want to say that uh, our colleague and friend, uh, uh, Gonzalo Varela, who's at the World Bank office, has uh, just put in the chat at Box, a very interesting study. I think he and his team at the Islamabad office of the World Bank are doing fascinating research. But with that, let me share my screen. And if it's okay, just to save bandwidth, I may uh, turn off my, uh, what call it, camera. And please let me know if uh, you can't hear me. Oh, I apologize, I'm just going to start. So uh, this is uh, more of a discussion to try to understand Pakistan's trade policies, I think. I will be able to answer some of the questions, or I hope I'll be able to answer some of the questions that Simon raised, which were very relevant. Uh, so a lot of the discussion that's taken place in terms of trade policies in Pakistan is really focused on how relatively closed Pakistan's economy has been. As, as Simon showed, and as uh, uh, Ambassador Manzur Emma that discussed, they're very high tariffs. There are subsidies, significant subsidies for the export sector. Now, I was fascinated to see Simon's presentation about how, you know, even countries Pakistan is competing with has large levels of subsidies and he's able to measure them. But Pakistan is doing that. And obviously, one of the issues which arises of heavy subsidization is, is competitiveness of firms uh, in the international markets. So I'll discuss that also. And one of the things we've seen, you know, Pakistan has been in multiple IMF programs over the last decade and a half. Pakistan is 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 constantly you know uh, in the process of of getting assistance from the world bank and the asian development bank which have been pushing very heavily for uh, freer trade regimes but it hasn't happened so one of the things i wanted to do was discuss one of the the impacts of the trade policies and number two is discuss you know some of the political or social you know the political economy aspects of the trade regime so one thing about understanding, and this is a little bit of a background, you know, and this will maybe clarify some of the issues which Simon and, and Ambassador Mansoor Ahmed raised, is who are what call it understanding trade policy in terms of who are the people that really influence trade policy. I think uh, ambas the ambassador had raised some of these issues, you know, and he was talking about you know the Federal Bureau of Revenue, which is a tax collection agency, determined import duties, and now it's being you know handed over to the Commerce Department. But, you know, it'd be important to try to understand who is influencing trade policies. What are the incentives for what call it for the people in the present system to keep the status quo? I think that's very important to understand, because if we understand that, then we may be able to try to figure out strategies for trade changing uh, trade policies. What are the other trade policies being focused upon? Uh, the Commerce Ministry, and I've been in discussions with them, I have been in previously, and I'm also in discussions with them now, is very heavily focused on trade agreements, and especially for FTAs, and, and uh, Ambassador Mansoor Ahmed talked about a very often cited free trade agreement between Pakistan and China, which we've also looked at. 
And then I'd like to just, you know, touch upon some of the macroeconomic issues which Pakistan faces and its reliance on, you know, somewhat restrictive trade policies. And you'll, you'll understand why, because of this balance of payments concerned growth situation. And I did want to mention something which I'm interested in, and I think we need to worry more and more about is, of course, the environmental impact of trade in the context of Pakistan. So let, let's try to understand what's, what's going on in terms of trade policy from the government side, right? The commerce officials and the tax officials are, you know, are, are, are very, of course, uh, you know, are very, very vocal about trying to keep import duties in place because, uh, you know, Pakistan has incredibly low tax to GDP rates. And Professor Manzu brought this up, and Clem was bringing this up. And import duties are a very reliable source of revenue. Now, as Clem said, has this changed? It has changed to some extent, but this is an amazing fact. I mean, if you think about it, in a country of 220 million people, there are really only million, million and a half taxpayers paying actually filing income taxes and paying income taxes. So you know that they have not been able to expand the tax base significantly, but they've been able to diversify sources of tax revenues. But a lot of that is based upon you know, sales tax, withholding taxes, things like that. So in a sense, there's still a very heavy reliance of the government on, on trade taxes. The, also, what determines trade policy from the perspective of the government very strongly is their, you know, of trying to find new markets. And I think this sort of touches upon what Simon is saying is, Simon said, look, you know, you've, you've been, you know, the unit values of exports have been falling, and they've been falling because we are going to see because of some of the, you know, you know, policies, trade policies. And number two is, that the government has been trying to focus on just these new markets, new markets, new products, and it's not been really, there's been no real focus on trying to improve the quality or, you know, move to higher levels of, you know, especially in our context, textiles. And then I would say that there is, you know, this whole policy, Professor, sorry, Ambassador Manzoor brought it up, which is really prioritizing duties on those sectors that which generate the largest revenues. I was talking to Gonzalo and you know, and other people, and you know, it's very simple, which is, you know, they, they look at trade policy as, you know, which are the ones we need to protect in terms of which are the ones we are, you know, regenerating the highest import duties, and that we need to make sure that we can at least maintain those levels of protection. And the tax people were very sure about that because they needed to maintain those levels of revenues. Uh, now it's gone to commerce, we hope that will change. And I think within commerce, they've set up, you know, also a tariff board, which is now outside of the Federal Board of Revenue to perhaps you know, change tariff policy to realize you know, all the things we're talking about that, which is one of the biggest things for influencing exports is to produce higher quality exports. You need imported higher quality inputs and tariffs are very high on those. And I think the tariff board would be discussing things like that. From the business side, there is a very, very strong lobby of large exporters and domestic producers who want the present trade policies to continue. You know, Pakistan, the majority, significant majority of Pakistan's exports are focused in the textile sector, a huge amount. This is, you know, you know, something which has been going on for the last 30 years or more, right? And, you know, these people have very strong lobbying groups. And I think, you know, it's important to realize that that will continue very strong links. And they, they, want, they want these subs subsidies and rebates on, on, on exports. And on the other side, domestic, you know, producers are very, very, you know, as, as Ambassador Manzu said, domestic producers of cars are very, very, you know, careful about making sure that their lobbying efforts to protect the car industry remain in place. So you have to understand that this is going on. And it leads to uncompetitive local markets, right? What are the incentives, right? Uh, I, I sort of touched upon some of these. On the government side, uh, government officials that produce, you know, promote particular sectors, get, you know, financial benefits, non-pecuniary benefits, there are obviously that, and that's not particular to Pakistan. That's, you know, that's a developing country issue. But there is this idea of, you know, when, you know, when Clem was asking and Simon was asking of diversifying your exports, there's this constant fear of, okay, let's try to, on the margins, increase our exports in the IT sector, try on the margins of increasing our sports good exports or, or our surgical good exports, which we focus a lot on it in our institution at the law school. But there is still this, this elephant in the room, which is the, you know, the textile sector and this huge amount of you know, pressure to maintain that, uh, the, the, you know, maintain those exports from that sector. On the business side, 
right? Exporters continue to produce these large quantities of very low value added goods. And what has actually been happening is there has been concentration because of trade policies in lower value added goods. I can give you one perfect example. One of the studies we looked at was the free trade agreement between China and Pakistan. And what happened was that in, if you look at the Pakistani exports to China, they started, you know, in terms of concentrating on particular products and which they were exporting, and those products were lower value added exports. So as opposed to, you know, you know, opening up a market and trying to get your higher value added products, they started switching to lower value added products. So total exports rose, but they rose in, in these categories, which are low value added. And then domestic producers, because of these import duties, you know, can, you know, continue producing lower quality goods without any effect effective protection. And I think because of entry restrictions, these markets are very uncomfortable. Because of oil, Fleming, I think we are losing him. Oh, you're muted, Clem. You're muted. Yes, I was. We are losing him. Are, are we? It's not my. It's not my machine. No, 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 no. Okay. I apologize. Uh, I lost my connection for a second. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. He's back. Yeah, you're I back. Apologize. Welcome back. <laughs> I apologize. I'm going to. You know, I, I promised to do this. Let me just uh, turn my camera off. No, so you're doing a bit. great job. Just con continue. Thank okay, you. Of course. Of course. Uh, let me just go back to my slides. Uh, I, I'm not sure where I lost people, but uh, <laughs> let me keep going, which is just in terms of, you know, some of the trade policies which are being pursued by the Pakistani policymakers is a large amount of bilateral trade agreements are being negotiated. As Ambassador Manzoor Ahmed said, not a lot of these are being signed, but there's a huge push. But one of the things we've looked at is, you know, and I think, you know, Simon pointed out, Clem pointed out, Ambassador Mansoor pointed this out, is that, you know, we saw that even though we signed this free trade agreement with China, the negotiators signed, you know, negotiated tariff rates from the Chinese side, which were still higher than the tariffs, which were still higher than the tariffs facing the ASEAN countries. So it wasn't very beneficial. Right? But let me just, in the for the sake of time, jump to the next slide, right? which is one of, the, one of the reasons we're not seeing significant changes in trade policy in Pakistan is that actually what is happening is that exports tend to be still so small that export firms are still not passing on the benefits to actual workers. So when you're talking about pr promoting exports, they think the exporters are getting richer, but there's no better jobs. There's no significant trickle down. And there's a very interesting research project which we worked on a few years ago, which looked at the football sector, you know, making footballs. Pakistan is one of the largest producers of footballs in the world. And we saw that we introduced a technology which would reduce costs and raise exports. But the workers were refusing to, to adopt that technology because they thought they were not going to get any benefits. So this is from the export side. People don't see better jobs or more jobs, right, because of higher exports. On the import side, people have been seeing better quality goods at a lower price, right? But they've also seen significant displacement. I think the Pakistan-China FTA, we've been doing a lot of research on it when we found that there has been reductions in employment, right, on those firms which are, you know, which. It, in the industrial sector in Pakistan, number one. And number two is now they see when there are no domestic competitors because we're relying on certain you know, imports for all of the domestic consumption, then large depreciations are leading to higher prices and people are then very opposed to open trade, which is, you know, we're not getting many benefits from exports and from the import side also, you know, we're just getting higher prices, et cetera. Right, so, you know, so I, I did want to mention that. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about really is the environmental impact of trade, 
right? One is that, and this is an important thing to know that a lot of environmental issues have been ignored when you're talking about exporters in Pakistan. And I think this is something we don't want to forget, right? Which is in order to promote exports, we've been in, in really ignoring environmental consequences. That's why, you know, when I sit here and my daughter is, you know, putting on their mask even before COVID because Lahore had one of the worst pollution rates in the world at Karachi and all, and these are all industrial hubs where a lot of these exporters are based. On the import side, I think there is, you know, there is some idea because the prime minister and the government has realized that you need to have renewable sources of energy. But there is this interesting dilemma, which is Pakistan has signed so many power agree purchasing agreements with independent producers that they actually have extra capacity. So now these power producers are very keen on trying to limit the amount of renewable energy being adopted in Pakistan. Now, luckily, they've reduced, you know, they've reduced the import duties on renewable energy, things like solar panels, et cetera. But on the other side of the coin, what they've done is they've started, you know, lobbying the government for higher sales taxes, et cetera. Right. So I think there is this, you know, something we need to keep an eye on. But I, I'll stop here and, and you know, and, and thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions. Um, Azam, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. I'm, are we okay? Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Azam, for that presentation. And perhaps as you pursue your work as, as a WTO chair, you might think in your research in your in your research pillar to wonder a little bit about if tariffs might, a lowering of tariffs in Pakistan might actually improve the export performance. Yes, yes. Just, just something to worry yes. about. I, I want to turn now, thank you, Azam. I want to turn now to Mr. Jabbar. He is a member of the, the Chamber of Commerce and he, he represents the private sector. It's one of the things that we would like to do in these previews is to bring the view of the private sector to bear on the, on the uh, evaluation, not evaluation, but on the reflections about trade policy. The private sector is vital in this, uh, in producing uh, improved export performance by Pakistan. And I look forward, uh, Mr. Jabbar, from hearing from you, the views that you have with respect to the trade policies that Pakistan maintains and measures that are maintained by others against, against Pakistan on how it, they influence what you in the private sector are able to do. Uh, well, Mr. Jabbar, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Clemens. Uh, I was just trying to sort of work out my arithmetics of speaking, 40 minutes for the speakers and 10 minutes for me. So I thought maybe my arithmetic works out to be only 25% of the time allocated to the speakers and I have to say something. So let me see how much justice I can make uh, with myself and the time which is made available to me. I'm in the trade politics uh, since over 25 years and I have been watching in this country almost all the scenarios related to trade policies, earlier of the trade policy trends and the import and export trend which remained in our favor before year 2000, you see. It was only, it crossed 10 billion US dollars when the, it was year 99 and 2000 somewhere. Now, having said so, so let me tell you one thing that uh, since uh, we are focused on discussing the trade policy reviews and the issues and the circumstances impacting or being expected to develop a positive impact on the development economics or whatever you call it, welfare economist, or whatever it is the jargon word in all the economies. Having said so, let me start from the reverse, I'm say from the Dr. Azam. I would uh, say nothing but to agree with him. He was perfectly right. He tried to analyze for the reasons as uh, where is wrong and what is wrong. Perhaps uh, where there was a shortcoming of his should be compensated by me because I would always consider that I'm a practicing professor and while considering others to be more on the academic side, though respectable for me because they are my teachers. Having said so, Dr. Azam was very much right that uh, who are interested in keeping 
such a pattern of trade policies, uh, strategic trade policy frameworks, which are doing nothing. And at the end of the day, I would say the outcome is almost, I would say, with abundant caution and respect that it is zero. It has been mostly, I would say, focusing on two or three parameters. Dr. Manzoor knows very well. I always call him my teacher, though he doesn't like that word. He said, no, we are mutually student and teacher of each other. So let me, I would say, accept that compliment. So the thing is that ke competitiveness, I would say, increasing the exports, new markets and all that. In year 99 and 2000, the same person today who is our advisor on commerce, the same person, at that time also he was a minister of commerce. He said that Pakistan is caught in a syndrome of 10 by 10. 10 products, 10 destinations. Today when I was looking, the situation is not much different. Um, so Dr. Azam rightly said, okay, if uh, I don't have time, but I can give you the statistics that okay, how much is textile and how much are other fuels and how much are other fuels, which are only few percentages. So this is what uh, we are presently at today. But I think uh, in Pakistan, the people of the doctrine of uh, import substitution, I'm sure about which Dr. Mizu was talking, became a forceful reason, I'm going to say partly partly or let us say, uh, let me say in major, by the influential groups uh, who thought that such a captive and protectionism would make them to make more money, you see. I must say, in a way, he is right. Let me tell you, in Pakistan, we are subsidizing about half a billion dollars export of textile of 12 billion, in which 3 billion is integrated on the imports because our exports of textile have a value of 25% of imports to be integrated. And it will be more when this time we are importing more cotton bells from other countries due to our lower crops. Now, having said so, so our data science and data banks are not very strong. And one thing which uh, I would uh, agree more with the Dr. Azam that he should also try to analyze more minutely being a professor in the research worked in I'm so World Bank, IFM, elsewhere, as how this influence can be dismantled, how this influence can be dismantled in order to be realistic and to be on the path where I think in a global village, the multilateralism can sort of uh, bring some changes towards the need of our progress. Having said so, you see, today's figure I was watching in Pakistan today, I was watching our figures of imports were 52.5 billion. And let me tell you, our financial year starts from July 21 to February 22. The imports are 52.56 billion. The exports are 20.55 billion. This figure always becomes the reason for a scaring or influencing a policy as how to reduce the imports because these, this differential is not covered by the remittances. This differential is not covered by the $6 billion IMF packages. And this differential is not uh, covered as a free lunch by the Friends of Democrat, Democracy of, for Pakistan or for the whole globe, you see. So that has uh, really, I, I would say, it has been influencing and bringing for distortion. Now, let me tell you one thing very interesting. Dr. Azam should work on it. Dr. Manzoor had been desiring with me from maybe 20 years back, we have been talking with each other that in Pakistan, the major, I would say, the criminal act is performed by our present taxation policy. Our present taxation policy from the Federation of Pakistan Chamber of Commerce last year, we were able to convince Prime Minister of Pakistan that you should bring all our 9,000 plus tariff lines at the rate of 5%. Average tariff in Pakistan is much higher than many other countries, say close to 10%. And while we were also protecting some of the requirements of very strong lobbies, because we didn't want to be out of the politics, we have to play a politics to I mean, say, arrange a winning game. 
So the 5% across the board and some of the tariff lines should be protected as of course there would be resistance and of course there would be strong lobbies to undo whatever we wanted. I think that that was, and moreover, very interesting, Dr. Manzu, I was discussing with him about an hour back. He also considered it me. We were able to even convince Prime Minister of Pakistan that how come at the import stage you are asking for consumption tax, you are asking for direct taxes before anything is manufactured and sold, you are capturing and taking in advance the consumption taxes. And before anybody makes any profit, what is called direct taxation or call income tax in our country, you are charging that also at import state. So this is the problem. I think in Pakistan, I would always think, you see, squarely, which I've been pleading for the last two years, I must say very strongly that our import policy and import policy tariffs that have to be tuned to the level of other countries and probably that may steer us the objective. Dr. Azam, let me come back to Dr. Azam. He said rightly, yes, about CPAC. When it was being negotiated, I was also of the view. I was involved. I said, look, you are only allowing our lower value added things to go up in the name of uh, FTA, other consideration or exclusive to and that is why we are exporting less than 2 billion. And in all these few years, we are now importing about 15 billion US dollars from China. So the problem is that a strategic trade policy framework, how it should be made captive of its real desires instead of captive of the influential groups who are there. In Pakistan, unfortunately, let me say, some, some people say that I talk against the principle of Plato, that I use tongue excessively. But sometimes I think I must also defer or may not be very good student of Plato. And let, let me say the truth, you see. The truth is that okay, this is the real situation over here. And once uh, the people who are surrounding the Prime Minister of Pakistan or the government of Pakistan, they are in the business. Now, today I was, I was attending a conference on the energy and you would be shocked to hear that a plant of 27% efficiency is still integrated to our national, you see, grid. And Dr. Azam was talking about uh, IPPs. Well, I say in Pakistan, we have commissioned criminal agreements with IPPs. I've been talking a lot. So the input ingredient of almost all the industries in private sector, I must say in the public sector, and let us say in the service sector, agriculture economy, is the cost of energy. I am saying that cost of energy, you see, has become almost uncontrolled. While it is uncontrolled and we are, uh, I am say, accumulating the trade debts, we are accumulating the circular debts and we are accumulating whatnot. But still, we are subsidizing our export industry. What, when I was making a calculation on just $12 billion export of textile, we are subsidizing about 2.25 billion US dollars. I said, look, if somebody, some economists like uh, Simon would start collecting real data. Probably he will find that 50% of these subsidies are prohibitive subsidies. I am say in terms of multilateral, you see, whole scenario. But then let me finally come back because I think uh, maybe my time uh, would be running out and I should be also disciplined to be answerable to the allocated time. I am say Dr. Simon, on the questions raised by these facts slides, it really impresses me. His all slides very much true to what my, I am say, short of his knowledge research would tell me that they were almost very close to my own working as a freelance, you know, uh, researcher. I am a member of Board of Development and Board of Governors of Sustainable Development Policy Institute, the biggest research think tank in Pakistan. And let me say that probably the question raised by the facts in the Simon's presentation needs to be worked upon more. Please, all of you should help us and really putting us to the path where we become educates of what is required in the economic development of this country. Thank you, Clemens. And I think uh, it appears that I'm closing to the allotted time. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much indeed. I'm, I'm intrigued by your suggestion of a uniform tariff of 5%. I think that's a great idea. Uh, before we go on, uh, Gonzalo Varela 
distributor rep distributed his report on export challenges and World Bank report on export challenges and import duties in Pakistan. Gonzalo, would you like to spend a few minutes or take a, take a moment or two to tell us more about that and the challenges that are being presented here and perhaps how import duties might help that? Gonzalo, the floor is yours, should you want it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clemens. Um, so just, you know, it was very interesting to, to listen to the previous presenters, uh, Dr. Mansour, uh, Simon, Azam, and, and, and Jabal Saab. Uh, so let me just mention two things that complement what, what they were saying before. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll structure them around two, two issues. One is related to import duties or tariffs. The other one is related around uh, export subsidies. So just complementing what was, mentioning, what was mentioned on, on, on the use of import duties that is extremely active, uh, right? The use of, of that instrument, as Simon mentioned before. I want to add that Another feature that import duties have in Pakistan is that uh, they are structured in a, in a very marked cascading way. Uh, and so high import duties on final goods and substantially lower import duties on, on, on raw materials and intermediates. And so that creates an anti-export bias, right? So that adds to the profitability of selling domestically rather than uh, exporting because the effective protection has been extremely high. So that's another feature that, that adds to the, to the reductions in incentives to export. And I think you mentioned before, what if, if import duties fall, perhaps we see exports increasing. Well, in the way they are structured right now, it's, it's likely that, that that's the case, right? If you, if you decrease import duties in a way that you also reduce the cascading, probably uh, you'll, you'll end up uh, doing that. And this is a message that we try to get across as much as possible when, whenever uh, we discuss this with the, with the government. Um, let me also mention that also Simon mentioned there are different types of tariffs, right, or import duties. And, and, and some of them are very ad hoc and require uh, a different uh, institutional, uh, you know, different rules. So, so the regulatory duties, additional customs duties get passed or get changed with cabinet approvals rather than with parliamentary approvals as, as tariffs require. And that also adds some uh, you know, are arbitrary to the to the process that is that is not good for policy stability. And let me also mention on the export subsidy, and with this I'll finish, that that the way export support is structured uh, sort of preserves the status quo. And so when when Simon was mentioning how unit values have actually been declining, uh, this is no surprise in the sense that the export support actually. Uh, uh, you know, it benefits incumbents that are doing the relatively low sophistication type of product against uh, the, the newcomers, the ones that are trying to diversify or the ones that are trying to produce something that is more uh, sophisticated. So this is something that we show it uh, and we analyze a particular export support scheme. Uh, and, and in the report, you can see how these instruments are biased uh, against newcomers, against uh, uh, firms that want to, to, to sophisticate. And so also no surprise, not only that unit values are falling, uh, but it's also no surprise that there is little entry and exit. If you look at exporters dynamics at the firm level, uh, there is little entry and, and exit of, of, of uh, exporting status in Pakistan when you compare it with, with countries that could be comparable uh, from, a, from a level of development point of view. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention these things. If, if you're interested in reading more about it, the, the report goes a little bit more in, in depth. Uh, I don't want to take more time, but that's that's all from, from my side. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to, to mention Gonzalo, this. Over. Gonzalo, thank you very much indeed. Now, before we're, we're about ready to, to go to questions and discussions, but before I do that, I, I'd like to give the floor briefly, if he wishes it, to Willie, to Willie Elfira, who directs the Trade Policy Review Division in the w, at the WTO. And perhaps, Willie, you might say a few things about your attempts to address Mansour's point that there, is, there has in the past been very little follow-up. And I know you've actually been trying to improve that particular situation. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. I know it, I know it wasn't very easy, but perhaps you can Talk a bit about that and, and a follow-up perhaps with 
an intent on bringing some movement towards a freer trade regime and an improved performance by Pakistan. Willie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Clem, and it's good to see you uh, there. And uh, congratulations to Lou and all the organizers of uh, this um, type of event. I think that it is an excellent complement to the actual trade policy review done by members. Uh, I believe that um, in the context of uh, the meeting of the members, um, they have certain approaches, uh, but this type of meetings organized by, by, the, by this group uh, inject some analytical uh, elements that we probably sometimes miss in the WTO. The presentation made by Simon who precisely <laughs> touched the points that sometimes we are not able to do plus the comments made by uh, Ambassador Mansour. Very nice to see you, uh, Mansour. Uh, excellent points, including the last uh, point uh, made by the private sector. As most of you uh, would know, the TPR uh, report that the Secretariat prepares uh, does not include uh, the private sector, and it's good to hear these, these points. Regarding your, your um, question, Clem, and a uh, very good point raised by, by Mansour, is what happens after the TPRB meeting in Geneva. It is true that uh, a lot of effort is put in the preparation of uh, not only the Secretariat report, but also the government report and the members' interventions. Uh, there are uh, a high number of questions, very interesting questions asked by the members and replies provided by the member and the review. So it is a huge amount of valuable information that if all of that ends at the meeting in Geneva, I would say it is a lost opportunity. And that's why uh, over the recent past years, we have put in place um, an activity that is called the uh, TPR follow-up seminar. The objective is to bring to the capitals uh, the outcomes of these reviews. What uh, are the main findings of the TPR uh, report? by the Secretariat, what are the main concerns expressed by the members? Uh, what are their preoccupations or complaints? So that to bring all these elements back to the capital and present them to the domestic stakeholders. So as with a view to do precisely what uh, uh, Mansour was saying, uh, have an impact on uh, trade policy changes. Uh, because when we have the meetings in Geneva, uh, of course, representatives from the Ministry of Commerce uh, will come or will participate. Uh, but trade policy changes are not done by only one ministry in, in the capitals. You all know that it requires interactions with other actors, Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Agriculture, and so on. So the purpose of these TPR follow-up seminars is precisely to bring back the points made by the members main outcomes of the of the review so that to be part of the uh, domestic uh, policy debate with a view to uh, prepare some some changes now this last portion is not part of the mandate of the trade policy review mechanism it's an addition and therefore it is uh, i would say voluntary it has to be requested by the member and the review so that we can uh, bring back these these points um, but that's that's what I wanted to to say. And once again, uh, congratulations for 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 organizing this uh, this event. Thanks, Clem. You are muted, I think. Yes, I I I muted myself as I started speaking. I'm clumsy with these machines. I your suggestion is very good, and perhaps Manzura, you might bring you might encourage. You, as um, you, Mr. Jabbar, might encourage the authorities to request a follow up in Pakistan on the trade policy review that is to take place. We're quickly running out of time, but there is still some time for discussion, some questions. The floor is open to anyone who wishes to take it. I don't see any hands up. Shall I just go to somebody? <laughs> we have a representative from the Pakistan mission with us. Perhaps you would like to take the floor for a minute or two? Mr. Khan, Mohammed Khan.
no, I don't think there is any, there, there's nothing there. We also have with us some, we also have with us a trade policy expert from the, from the International Monetary Fund. And as has been mentioned, there have been a number of programs of the, international, of the International Monetary Fund with Pakistan. And part of the emphasis has been on trying to engender a freer trade regime. Brad, would you like to say a few words about this? Brad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Clem, and let me let me thank everybody involved in this discussion today. It's been it's been really, really, really interesting. Uh, um, oh, oh, I'm trying to think quickly whether I have something to say on the on the particular topic that Clem ju just mentioned. But I had been thinking about jumping in just as a, also as a as a veteran of uh, of the TPR process. And, and just to mention that I think this current initiative sounds, uh, and as Willie was just saying, this, this current initiative sounds very constructive uh, and, and helpful. But I, I guess, uh, um, I, I guess, um, as Clem, Clem notes, um, so we, we have from the IMF had a number of programs with Pakistan over the years. I didn't think to go back and sort of look at that or. I probably should have and could have been better prepared, but certainly, sort of stepping back a little bit, the um, you know, ensuring continued openness, building on that openness during the course of a of of these programs has traditionally been been an important step because we believe then that that and I think experience demonstrates that this this um, this uh, provides a stronger environment in which countries can then. Um, Adjust their balance of payments going forward in the future. Um, so, so th these have been uh, there have been some elements in, in in some recent programs, not as much uh, in, in you know the past decade or so as there might have been in, in the in the past, reflecting a, a number of factors, uh, which I won't really go into in, into now. But um, let me leave it there, Clem. Thanks for the opportunity for me to to jump in. Um, uh, again, I think it's a really, really constructive initiative and, and a great complement to the uh, vitally important TPR process in the WTO itself. Brad, thank you very much, and you've raised interest. Manzuri, you wish to say a few words in, in follow up to Brad? Um, yes. And Manzur, allow me to break in just a moment, please. We're, about, we're, we're almost out of time. We have about 10 minutes left at most. Perhaps you would like to respond to Brad, but continue a little farther and to address some of the questions that have been raised by others during this particular, during this particular process. Uh, give a bit of a summing up of what it is that you think has, has gone on. And then I will turn to Simon, to Azam, and to Jab Mr. Jabbar again. Manzur, it's yours. Uh, Clem. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Let me respond to Brett's point, and and then give me one minute. Ask ask Azam and and Simon first, and then I'll I'll come back to you if you want my summing up or something. Just I need a minute or so. Okay. You see, one of the problems with our um, taxation, all these policies, the trade policy, has been our repeatedly going to IMF programs, and the problem is that. Uh, when they sign up this um, uh, with, with IMF for the loan uh, agreement, one of the demands often is raise your taxes by 50%. Okay, that's all right. We can, we can double our taxes, whatever. But then they don't put a condition as to how those taxes will come. And so the easiest way for Pakistan is, is, is to go to imports and, and raise them there. For, but, but IMF has a lot of cloud. They can say it. For example, recently they asked the government of Pakistan to put this um, sales tax on baby's milk and all, uh, supplies to hospitals, farmers, seeds, solar panels, everything. But what they don't ask them is open up your trade policy. They used to at one time, but, but they, they stopped doing it. And I think that creates a lot of problem for us because uh, uh, you know, but they, the government always says it's because of IMF we are doing this, we are putting more taxes and, and it's always indirect taxes. So my request for IMF would be if they want taxes, they should, they should make it more conditional, indirect direct taxes, rather than more from tariffs and imports. Uh, that, that's our big problem. And I'll, I'll have one more minute after, after others have said something. 
Okay, well, I, th I think you make a very good point, but IMF programs, Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, typically contain a provision that there be no new restrictions on trade. So perhaps when they ask you to increase your tariff, when they ask you to increase revenue by 50%, they imply that it should be a domestic effort. Simon, may I turn to you for a, a follow-up, a summing up, as it were, of what it is that you want to say? Thanks, Clem. I mean, I take two, I take two things from this conversation. One is the very strong public finance trade policy link, which we've just been talking about here. And, and surely it's in the interest of not just Pakistan, but also Pakistan's trading partners, uh, that a uh, robust system of domestic taxation be developed. I know that takes time and, and a like, but it seems to me that that's one trajectory, uh, which would be in the interests of uh, most, uh, all of the members of the WTO. And then uh, the second point I take listening to Gonzalo is, uh, you know, the, the real um, worries one has with certain types of export incentive schemes, which appear to sort of lock in the relatively unimaginative, less productive exporters, and perhaps don't create space for the new exporters who want to come in and do higher quality products. So I think that, you know, the export side of, um, of trade policy, which is uh, often overlooked, is something which certainly uh, comes up in sharp relief here in this in this case. Thank you. I agree. Simon, I agree completely. We, this discussion of tariffs has raised uh, the interest of Salamat Ali. He wishes to say something about tariff collection in Pakistan. Salamat, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Clement. And it's really nice to see so many colleagues discussing this very important issue of trade policy. So I have been working with trade policy in Pakistan for 25 years before moving out and joining other institutions. So tariff has been elephant in the room for a long time, as Dr. Mazur has mentioned, as other colleagues have also mentioned, around 50% of Pakistan's revenue comes from the tariff. And there have been many suggestions. So one of the suggestions which we just discussed is that they have moved this trade policy issues to the Ministry of Commerce from Federal Board of Revenue. So that was very interesting that initially FBR used to set up these tariffs. So they cut custom duty, then they put sales tax on that, then additional sales tax, then anti-dumping duty. If you see the tariff profile for the last 20 years, effective tariff has been almost the same. It has not gone down if you include all these non-tariff barriers. But what this has done, as Gonzalo has mentioned, it has provided protection to the domestic producer. So they don't have incentive to export so while I was working there in Pakistan in 2017, I looked at the data of firm level exports. What we see that Pakistan has around 15,000 exporters and around that 100 exporters account for 70 to 80% of trade. And if you do further breakup of these 100 exporters, they sell two thirds of their exports within Pakistan. And that substantiates the point which Gonzalo has mentioned. So these exporters have done much incentive to their send their goods abroad because they have this captive home market within the country. So let's see how this tariff board works in the Ministry of Congress. But I still have other suggestion that if we can push that through this forum, because it, WTU has this model of custom administration that who handles custom administration. So one third of the world is custom administration are part of revenue administrations and two third are part of either Ministry of Commerce or their independent board of revenues. And if you see the link between financial management, as Professor Simon has mentioned, revenue collection and the custom administration, there is a strong link, a strong correlation around that. The custom administration, which are part of revenue administration, they are more focused toward the tariffs and revenues because they get these targets to collect revenues. And the custom administration, which are part of Ministry of Commerce or independent board of revenues, they are more trade focused. They try to facilitate the trade, or liberalize the trade. So I leave it here just for the thinking of the colleagues, because I'm, I see that we are running out of the time. Thank you, Clement. Yeah, we are running out of time and thank you very much for your intervention. What, the way I, what I'd like to do now is to give about a minute to two minutes each to, to our speakers in the following order. I'll start with Mr. Jabbar, then go to Azam and finish off with Mansoor. And at, that, at the end of that, I will hand the floor back to Lou to close the meeting. So, uh, Mr. Jabari, are you still there?
perhaps more yeah, on your yeah, five percent you tariff. Yeah, I'm very much. I'm very much there, and I would be there till ah, there you are. You, till you will officially announce sign and die of this meeting. Okay. Now I think uh, on the IMF side, I'll just talk very quickly, thirty seconds. So see, on the IMF okay. side, they are seeking I'm mean, sure tax reforms. They talk about. Uh, Structural developments. They talk about productive developments. I have yet to understand okay, what are those actions which should really steer us out of present problems. Let me now just say in ten seconds more. The special assistant to prime minister for the last one year has said that I have seven point five million identified tax potentials who can be brought in the net, and they will generate more than fifty to hundred billions of rupees. Then our finance minister. For the last since he has taken over, he is saying that 15 million we have identified potential taxpayers which can be added to the tax network. FPCCI, I represent Federation of Pakistan Chamber of Commerce Industry, all the private sector of Pakistan. We have identified four million existing industrial connections which can be registered, put to the taxation, and I think all these together you can just. Uh, I mean, say if IMF, uh, I mean, the man is there. He can just see yeah, how he can increase this potential. Number two for him is that okay, I am a power system specialist. I take lot of positions on the power. They should now really go for the reform in the power side. They should stop all the power stations which have efficiency lower than thirty percent, so that in order to absorb the additional available energy and avoid. Take or pay system conditions. I think he would understand better. And finally, for one minute more, I think what Simon has told questions raised by these facts. The first para is so impressive for me. I will really would like that he should work more upon this. Maybe it will be a guidance. I will read it. What policy objectives and other factors account for the extensive resort to import tariff changes by Pakistan? Could these objectives be attended better? Are more cheaply using other policy instruments. I think that is wonderful. I am a part of the research, and so Dr. Azam can also help us. I am say in finding the appropriate answer, how he would insulate and isolate the increasing influence of the tycoons on trade policy. And Dr. Manzoor, finally, I think he is a master of all these understandings, and I am sure that whatever I have talked. he would uh, he would be uh, kind to appreciate that on the simplification of tariff structure and all that he can communicate with imf if imf would agree to he is a real expert and a real friend of pakistan and real friend of multilateralism thank you very much mr jabbar i'm delighted that you were able to join us azam just a few words to wrap yes, up yes No, I I I found this conversation fascinating. The one slide I missed, unfortunately, when I lost my connection, was explaining this exact same thing of the macro issues of the balance of payments problem. What basically happens is very simple. We enter an IMF program, our growth slows down. We exit the program. We spend a lot of money. The government spends a lot of money. Our growth goes up about five percent. When it goes up about five percent, our imports. grow to unsubstantial you know levels which we can't sustain anymore our exports don't grow up and then we hit a balance of payments of crisis and go back to the imf and that happens every 5 years it's this threshold the reason for it is that we're producing lower quality exports as sir simon pointed out and gonzalo pointed out and i think the re- what we need to do is we need to tell you know the government and the stakeholders to lo- understand that to get your export levels up you need to not only diversify in terms of products you need to produce higher value added products those higher value added products can only be comp- what call it can if you could reduce first of all the distortionary effects of the rebates the second thing is also to reduce imports on you know on things like which are high quality intermediate inputs things like you know sports wear requires these dry, you know quick dry drying fabrics there are high tariffs on things like those and you know so these exporters still stick to you know cheap jeans and t-shirts we need to get out of that cycle i uh, i was just going to say you know one more thing but but why don't i stop here i i found the conversation fascinating and thank you clem thank you lu and everyone for your time azam thank you very much and good luck in your responsibilities as wto chair thank you manzur so much. the last word is yours Yes, uh, thank you, Clem. Uh, I, I know we have run out of time. Just, just two points. 
I, I just hope that uh, in the near future, we'll get some political stability and, and then we can uh, get on with this reform process because in the current uh, scenario, it's, it's very difficult. The good thing is that all the political parties in Pakistan now agree that you know we should normalize trade in the region, whether it's with India, whether it's with Iran, whether it's Afghanistan. And, and there were some security concerns and, and hopefully they're also now uh, aboard, but the problem may be on the Indian side and ho hopefully they can re reciprocate. Um, there are two other little points. Uh, it was good to hear from Wiley about this uh, um, TPR follow-up action. And, 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 and I hope uh, after this TPR, this, uh, something happens and maybe Dr. Professor Chaudhary, but now the TPR chair, he can, he can do a little more extensive on this, domestic and international and everything. Um, regarding these terror reforms, it's a cash 22 situation. Whenever they think of reforms, bring some tariffs down, they say, oh, the, you know, the, the newspaper are full of headlines. Our trade deficit has gone so much and immediately they put a clam. But you know, so something, I mean, other countries, India had similar problem. Many other countries, when they started opening up, they had similar problems, but they were able to overcome. And I hope we can find some way with IMF or something so that that temporary time, one or two years when we have this big gap can be filled up and then we can get on the reform. Thank you very much, Clem, and thank you everyone for this opportunity. Manzura, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And Azam, Mansoor makes a good point. Perhaps in your outreach, you might encourage a follow-up to the, to the TPR process. Lou, we are essentially out of time. The floor, the floor is yours to close the meeting. Yeah, thank you very much, Clem. Uh, thanks a lot. And my apologies for, for a, a little bit of dysfunction of my computer. So I was disconnected for a while. But what I hear is actually uh, is what we expect from this exercise is a kind of candid, forward-looking uh, kind of discussion uh, on the trade policy trends of Pakistan. Of course, I mean, uh, the, the, the part of which I lost without me would be even better uh, without me there. Uh, so the second point is that uh, uh, this is uh, the first uh, uh, trade policy preview exercise we are doing now. And we hope we could cover, uh, depending on uh, availability of panelists and everything, that we will try to cover also uh, uh, some more. Uh, so to just to, to name them there, uh, possibly Ghana, Mexico, US, South Africa, Brazil, and Kazakhstan. I do see that some of the delegations, such as Brazil and others, uh, and Mexico are present today. So I would very much welcome any kind of outreach from you and we'll of course come to you uh, for, for any uh, comments or, or, or suggestions. This is uh, of course an independent exercise by FMG, but of course we welcome any inputs from you and other colleagues on how we could do this better. And with that, I thank Clems very much for his leadership and also the whole panel for the great contribution and for the audience uh, to be with us uh, today. Uh, and I uh, thank you very much. Please follow uh, on our uh, activities and we will have more uh, coming in the future on many other things uh, uh, important for the system. So thank you, uh, thanks to you all and I'll see you next time. Thank you, thank Lou, you. and we're closing the meeting. Hi, everyone.